There are six assignments, although we might not do all of that. Each assignment may have only certain parts required, other parts are only for demonstration and learning. Building circuits, do measurements, and test the circuit performance is all about each assignment. This course is a lab course, hence, it goes without saying that this is about hands-on work. The assignments are designed to be self-guiding, allowing one to work as independently as possible. Follow instructions like a cookbook. There is no secret. Just do the work satisfactorily and one will be successful. Consider this example, lab assignment 1. Its theme is about current and voltage, two most basic and essential concepts of circuits. We will also learn the rudimentary concepts of serial and parallel in electrical control and distribution. To get start, open the cookbook. It has several parts. This one has an introduction, then A, B, C, D, and a part of summary discussion and conclusion that is in every lab report. Along with the cookbook is the recipe book. Each part, like a dish, has its own recipe, which is called lab guide. A lab guide file can be big, hence, each cookbook may have several lab guides because it is not practical to combine all lab guides into one single file like the lab report. This one is split into three guides. One part without any guide is the summary discussion and conclusion, because this is your own. You are the author of this. This is the ultimate objective of each assignment, which is your learning, the knowledge you earn, gained from the empirical experience in doing the work. Hence, it is obviously important. Let's use a different analogy other than culinary. Suppose one wishes to compete in an athletic event, say, the decathlon. The prize is a trophy or a medal. But no athlete would just simply show up at the event to compete for a medal. They spend years of training. But a day of training, with sweats and pains, doesn't promise anything, because there is no medal to have at the end of the day. So, what is the point of working so hard on a day that there is no payoff at the end? The payoff is invisible externally. But things are going on inside their bodies even when they rest at night. Every part of the body, every organ, every cell is undergoing a transformation. This transformation is the payoff that an athlete is looking for in the training. So, what is the payoff when you are working on building the circuits, do the measurements in a lab assignment? Is it your report? And the grade of the report? Is that the proverbial medal or trophy you are looking for? The real payoff of your hard work is the transformation going on inside your brain. The neural network is busy to wire your new knowledge, and the activity that is actuating this rewiring is when you have to sit down, think through of what you have done, the results you have obtained, analyze, infer, deduct, formulate, generalize, cogitate on their meanings to synthesize a holistic understanding, and write the summary discussion and conclusion. You will have that unmistakable, quote unquote, eureka moment, or, the feeling of I get it now. You will know it when you have a sense of pride and satisfaction in your work. This is the payoff that you should be aiming for, like what an athlete aims at the end of days, months, or years of training. The corollary is that if one starts with the mindset of doing the lab like a skullduggery chore, find every possible way to cut corner and skim through the steps just to get it over with, without any curiosity, interest, and desire of learning, the end result would be like someone who trains for a marathon by taking a cab ride every day along the route to get used to it. This is one of the most common expression of the unsettling feeling when facing unfamiliar materials in the lab assignments. What comes first? Galileo dropped two iron balls, one large one small and demonstrated that the heavier didn't fall faster. A very simple demonstration that uncovered a secret of nature, that for thousands of years, people would have rather made assumptions, or looked up in ancient books, or holy writings, 
or other authoritative sources rather than doing the experiment to find out oneself. What comes first? For thousands of years, astronomers in many ancient civilizations had made remarkably accurate measurements of the motions of the planets in the sky. There had been countless mythologies, theologies, and punditry theories and treatises in various cultures on how or why the sun and other celestial bodies revolved around the earth the way they did. Yet, no one before Newton had thought that an empirical observation of a natural force that made an apple fall, would be the same and only force needed to account for the mysterious celestial motions. Michael Faraday never had an ECE course. In fact, he never attended a college, and worked as a bookbinder. Even if he had attended college, he would not have had any lesson on, well, what later on known as Faraday's law of magnetic induction. If he had not had a chance to learn it in a course, how could Faraday have explained his circuit experimental observation? What comes first? If there were an omnipotent being who created the law leading to the existence of light, that being would immediately cease to be omnipotent. Because once the law is created, even the being itself cannot violate own's law. No one can arbitrarily change the law of nature, otherwise, the universe as we know it would not have existed. Since it exists, hence, no being can be arbitrarily omnipotent. Jesting aside, learning from doing experiments, that is, empirical-based learning is the very essence of modern scientific and engineering knowledge. Doing experiments is difficult painstaking and costly, hence it is not practical to always learn this way in class. It is far more cost-effective to learn from the synthesized and organized collected work of many, which is why we have courses that teach theories of things such as circuit theory. However, when the opportunity arises, such as this lab course, we should undertake the spirit of knowledge formation that countless predecessor scientists and engineers who went through empirical learning to create the theories that you now learn in the various courses. Hence, thinking originally, objectively to understand the circuits that you build and measure, is the appropriate lifelong empirical method of learning that you can take with you once you leave school and pursue your professional career. In the real world, people do experimentation every day to understand, design, innovate, and create the technologies that benefit us. So, if there is something you haven't learned yet in doing the circuits, now is precisely the time to learn it empirically. You will receive a basic electronics kit to build the circuits. The measurements will be mostly done with the DG Lent AD2, except when it cannot. Even if you go to the lab and use the instruments there, there will be occasions when the AD2 is more convenient because of its fast interface with the computer for data acquisition and control. There will be other odds and ends components. In the follow, let's consider items that you might already have, or may be able to acquire on your own, or the course might be able to provide. This is to be determined throughout the course. For the time being, let's just discuss about these items. A household digital multimeter will be very useful for measuring currents, resistors, diodes, and some can also measure capacitors. For power supplies, at home you will need two 12 volt DC power supplies for the op amps used in labs 4, 5, and 6. Many households have unused DC supplies from various electronics, especially security cameras. You might purchase lower voltage op amps, such as 5 volts which can use the DC power from the AD2 and you would not need these power supplies. It should be noted that even before the current situation of online coursework, many students in the past preferred to do extra work at home on the circuits besides the time spent in the lab. These students had their own hobby-style electronics equipment like these. With regard to certain supplies, if financial constraint is not an issue, LEDs are inexpensive and one might wish to purchase on one's own, instead of receiving distribution of a handful from the course. The issue is not about the cost. It is about the logistics that the lab assistant has to divide, package, distribute, and make personal contact in time like this. It is far more convenient if each acquires on one's own. As shown here, the LEDs are sold in packages of several hundred, 
and perhaps you will use no more than 20 or 30 throughout the course. The leftover will come in handy for other projects or hobbies. This is another example of the advantage if one can acquire certain electronics supplies on one's own. Labs 5 and 6 require certain capacitors as shown in the list. A number of individuals in the past had lost or had them missing, and had to drive to the undergraduate lab for replacements. Some found the boxes for the ones they needed were empty. They tend to be empty on the night that one needs the most to build a circuit for the due date the following day. An individual recounted that, by purchasing a pack of capacitors for under $10, before today inflation, he saved two 45-minute drives, not to mention avoiding the risk and mental anguish of finding empty boxes of components, or having to sort through the kit and identifying the correct components. There are little things that one can do when receiving the electronics kit that will save hassle and time later on. For example, the various capacitor and resistor components might come in mixed up in a plastic bag. One can identify and separate them now once for all, and save a lot of time when building circuits. Just like many household problems can be fixed in 10 minutes but it would take 2 hours in a home supply store to select the right items, not to mention multiple trips to return and exchange. It is not an exaggeration to say that 80 to 90% of the time in building a circuit is spent on looking for components, subsequent removal of the wrong components and putting in the correct ones. In order to run the lab guide apps, you will need Mathematica or at least the free CDF player. To mention once again, the lab assignments are designed to be used with the associated lab guides. Mathematica software is required. You don't need to do any programming or computation to use the guides. To complete a lab assignment, do every task in the lab report outline. There is one-to-one -one matching between the list of tasks and the lab guide app items. A single step in of a lab report can be as simple as a question that requires only a short answer. Or a hands-on task like building a circuit. Or can be extensive work like conducting a whole scheme of measurement and analysis of something. Consider this first example. This lab item will ask just a simple question and it requires only a one or two sentence answer. This step 0.1 of part introduction of lab 2 asks what a typical AC adapter such as for a laptop does. Open the corresponding lab guide item for a discussion leading to the answer. The follow is from the guide. The function of an AC adapter is to take AC power input from the wall plug, and gives a DC power output for the appliance, such as a laptop. The input AC voltage varies as a sinusoidal function of time, alternating between positive and negative between the two terminals. The output of the adapter is a constant voltage, which is 19.5 volt in this particular case, and it doesn't change versus time. This is an example of a more substantial hands-on step, this step A.1 of part A of lab 2 instructs the student to build the circuit on the breadboard. In other words, this is what real circuit building is about. The follow is what the lab guide does. There are many ways to build a circuit based on the schematic. Below is only an example. Whether building the circuit by your own design or using the step-by-step -step applet, always make a mental correspondence between a physical element, such as a wire, a resistor, a LED, with its representation in the schematic. This practice can help one to quickly get a hang of it and become an expert in short order. Put in resistors R1 and R2. Put in pairs of input LEDs. Put in bridge LED. Put in pairs of output LEDs. Put in return wires and the rectifier circuit is completed. You can exit or move on to see locations of the nodes for future measurements. This is node A. This is node B. This is node C. This is node D. This is node C. 
This is node B. This is node A. The rectifier circuit is completed. Take out return wires. Take out pairs of output LEDs. Take out bridge LED. Take out pairs of input LEDs. Take out resistors R1 and R2. Put in resistors R1 and R2. Put in pairs of input LEDs. Put in bridge LED. Put in pairs of output LEDs. Put in return wires and the rectifier circuit is completed. You can exit or move on to see locations of the nodes for future measurements. This is node A. This is node B. This is node C. This is node D. The most meaningful tasks of lab assignments are usually those involving demonstrations, measurements, and analyses of the circuits. The following is an example of such a step, although it is quite simple, comparing with others of the same type. This is a demonstration of the circuit shown above. Later, when you learn about capacitor in lab 5, you will see that it can store electrical energy, and this shows the processes of charging and discharging. The LEDs are the current indicators. One block of LED is active in the discharging, and the other block is active in the charging. Each block has a serial resistor to limit the current. This is analogous to, say a household appliance with rechargeable batteries, and there may be a LED to indicate when the batteries are being charged or discharged. With two weeks per assignment, the semester can accommodate six assignments and there are two to three weeks including holidays to spare. All the lab instructions are posted online and one can work ahead of schedule. In a previous semester, 20% of students had enough extra credits and they did not have to take the final exam. The course has a simple road map. Although the average duration of a lab assignment is two weeks, there will be a flex period of due dates that is the overlap between the labs. One doesn't have to completely finish one to start another one. The first step is usually the hardest, and it isn't lab one. It is the logistics we need to get start. It is like going on a hiking trip. We need to prepare and check everything. Proper shoes, dresses, food, and water, equipment and things for shelter and in response to weather, emergency first aids and other supplies, etc. It is usually a bother when you plan it, but they will be well appreciated when you need them. Hence, it is best to plan now for the course, especially if you anticipate to work a lot from home. Even for this instructor, he hadn't anticipated that little odds and ends things could piled up to fill a whole box at the end of the course. Fortunately, with online purchasing, one can always get by in a pinch, although it costs money. However, like a student who spent less than the price of a restaurant dinner, or five drinks from an overpriced coffee franchise, he had all the resistors, capacitors, LEDs and whatnot to avoid the stress, the mental anguish of not having the right things to complete the assignments, while cruising along to enjoy the pleasure of learning and skipping the final. This is the end of this first lecture. There will be a separate lecture on how to prepare the lab report, such as recommended format, graphics, and media. And most important of all, the criteria of satisfactory technical presentation.